we've heard about the Vietnamese community, and we know mm -hmm. that their issues, mm -hmm. even though they're Asian, are different mm -hmm. from the Chinese language community. Yeah, I wouldn't say there's a lot of difference because there is a transitional period of time that you need to take care of a child when it first when a child first uh, tried to assimilate to society. But I would say it's almost uh, among uh, a lot of Chinese uh, parents, it's, it's, it's part of education that you just need to be educated on, uh, on, on your own language when you first get the chance to be to have a head start when you had to speak the language, write the language when Chinese. you're home. Sure, Chinese. and a lot of Chinese well, what, are w even willing after school send their children to four or five hours of Chinese school, you know, taking money out of their own pocket in order so to do that. So are you taking that. advantage of bilingual education? education just to have an uh, education training for for the children instead of going to a separate Chinese school bilingual education it's an opportunity to go to well, well, why, why should the public pay for that for that cultural well uh, not everybody can afford that uh, well, bilingual education to uh, say I'm sorry N number one that's not the purpose of bilingual education is to maintain a native language the purpose of bilingual education first and foremost is to use the native language in order to learn the secondary language English mm -hmm. better and does it work mm -hmm. Again, uh, the, the, uh, after $100 million of research on it, there's still disagreement and it's still inconclusive. Yeah. Right, I think that's as a result that you got different school districts who's uh, trying to try new things. Like right. in San Francisco, they're trying the, uh, the Academy for Language, which mm -hmm. is in essence trying to teach a second language in school and welcome everybody who's interested in that particular language and try to see if they can excel. But are the, is the Chinese community generally happy with the way bilingual education has addressed their needs? Well, I would say that uh, in general, there are still controversies as to whether they are to doing exactly, the implementation is doing exactly the way they liked it. But the mere fact that the kids who has been having problem with learning new things and get a teacher who can give them a, a good explanation and you know help them out in, in that area has been very important. Our quick, a quick answer, if bilingual education were to go away, would the Chinese community be up in arms? Um, I would say you got a very significant force from the Chinese community that would uh, object to that. All right, Mei Ling, uh, we've got to take a break. Uh, we've heard about the different views on bilingual education. What reforms do exist? Coming up, we'll talk to Ron Unz, the man who'd rather kids learn in English. This is NCM, the New California Media. And welcome back. It's NCM, the New California Media. I'm Emil Guillermo with members of our NCM network, the journalists who cover California's ethnic communities. We've talked about bilingual education and how there seems to be the need for reform. Our special guest doesn't stop there. He wants to do away with bilingual education. He started an initiative drive that some say may be the next divisive issue in our state, the next 187 or 209 right here in California. Ron Owens is a Silicon Valley businessman who ran against Pete Wilson for governor in the last election. He joins us now. Mr. Owens, uh, thank you for joining us here on NCM. Well, very glad to be here. Uh, why don't you explain the initiative? Is it too far-fetched to say it could be the next 209 or 187 in the state? I really would hope not. At least the early indications from both public opinion and elite media seem to indicate that the vast majority of people in California of all ethnic groups really want a school program that teaches English to their children as quickly as possible, especially for young children. And I really think, you know, potentially this initiative could be much more unifying rather than divisive in that under the right circumstances it ha could help to get rid of some of the mistrust different groups have for each other. So in your heart of hearts, the motivation wasn't to climb in on any kind of 187 bandwagon, some kind of slash and burn kind of divisive thing, but really to what? To better education? Or for that, that's primarily it. I mean, to be honest, the numbers of the current system are so amazingly bad. And most people aren't aware of them. And the fact right now is that of the children who don't know English well in the current public schools, only 5 or 6 percent each year will learn out enough English to be reclassified as proficient. And the system overall just isn't working. And my initiative, for example, wouldn't <coughs> eliminate bilingual education, but it would make the primary choice for children when they start school, especially young children, English language immersion, so they would learn English as quickly as possible. There still would the op be the option for parents, if they feel very strongly that they want their children to be in a bilingual program, to still have that program for their children. But it would be more an option rather than the default. But, but isn't it kind of like the slippery slope? Doesn't it essentially gut what's in existence now for, for, for people who want bilingual education? I couldn't argue with that because the current system just doesn't work. And in fact, the reason I started the initiative were some of those stories about parents who actually started, had to start a boycott of their own elementary school to force the school to be willing to teach English to their children. And when things have reached the stage where parents have to use political pressure to force a school to 
teach English. I mean, that really is absurd. All right, Mr. Reynolds, let's turn to our panelists. Uh, Kevin yeah. Weston, New Bayview. What is the Ebonics issues falling in there? Because it seems like the timing of this, of this initiative is falling when Ebonics kind of brought bilingual education to the front pages. So where would that, that issue so fall? That part of the timing was really more coincidental. In fact, it was interesting because when I was discussing bilingual education <laughs> with certain friends of mine, especially in the East Coast, they really didn't seem to think it was very interesting. And then suddenly the, bilingual, the Ebonics issue arose and they saw the extent to which certain ideas can be taken past even their illogical conclusions to the point of what I think is just absurdity. I, I really do believe one reason the Ebonics came up as an issue is the question that if you use the same classification criteria in which right now so many immigrant children are classified as non-English proficient, apparently according to that same methodology, 80% of African American children would be classified as non-English speaking in California. And under those circumstances, the argument can be made is if they don't do well in these tests, just like immigrant children don't, why don't they get the extra money as well? But, but why single out bilingual education? It sounds to me if the black children aren't doing well, it might be just be an over, uh, just a total overhaul of education oh, is needed. I agree with you. To be honest, what we're talking about is only a small part of the problems in California's public education system. The system's in disastrously bad shape for black children, for Hispanic children, for Asian children, and for Anglo children. But this is one of the few areas that lends itself towards direct political action. In other words, there's no way of passing an initiative that shall say all the teachers shall be better teachers, the schools shall be better run, and the children shall learn. While on the other hand, a program like this, which I believe is keeping back so many immigrant children, it can be attacked directly, and I think it should be. All right, Henry? Conservative, my thing that your English for the Children initiative is a intensive bilingual education program in disguise. You will spend $50 million for the next 10 years, intensify the program, creating more bureaucracy for the school districts. You make it an option, but also creating an administrative burden for the local communities, especially for the children. And you know, minority uh, parents don't have the, the, the connection or the knowledge of the, how mm -hmm. the system functions in order to opt into that intensive bilingual education. So this one could be subjected to attack from the conservative, also from the community at large. How do you respond to two sides of the attack? That, that's a very reasonable point. In fact, one of the interesting things about this initiative is some of the most fervently anti-immigrant activist groups have really been very critical of the initiative because it would spend more money on providing adult English language <coughs> education programs for adults who don't know English very well. In terms of the school bureaucracy, what you're saying is perfectly correct. I think one of the greatest tragedies of the current bilingual education system is that such limited polling data exists shows most, at least Latino immigrants, don't really like the program. But since they're not politically active, and in many cases they're very busy with their own jobs and their own lives, it's very difficult for them to persuade a school to reorient their children towards an English language program. So, you know, certainly that part of the system would be as much of a problem under my initiative as under the current system. But I think the difference is an English language immersion program where young children are taught English as soon as they start school is much easier for a bureaucracy to implement effectively. Yeah, but can the, can the kids survive? Well, I don't really think so. You see, one distinction we have to make is between very young children and children who are 14 or 15 years old. For older children, it makes, I think, a lot of sense under certain circumstances for, the child, for them to be taught in their native language and other classes while they're learning English. But for five or six-year-old children, it's so easy at that age to learn English. I think the best thing is that they learn it right away. The intellectual basis for uh, bilingual education is this belief that it takes five to seven years to learn the secondary language to academic proficiency. We all know that one can learn a language orally in about two years, but five to seven years academically. Do you have, and obviously there's many questions as to whether that's a valid statement, mm -hmm. do you have any indication uh, that any studies that would show otherwise, uh, that it takes actually two years, three years, one year? Well, I mean, part of it is there have been certainly academic studies on both sides of that question. In fact, I think the bulk of the evidence is that young children can learn English very quickly. But, you know, the bottom line is that just common sense tells us, and personal experiences, I mean, so many people I know are immigrants from other countries who came here as young children. They all seem to agree that if you're five or six or seven, it just takes a few months up to maybe a year to learn English fluency.
And you see, at the age of five or six, there's really not much <coughs> academic knowledge that you really have. In other words, at five, you mostly draw with crayons, whether you're drawing with crayons in English or in Spanish or in Chinese. And so if the children of that age are taught English very quickly, they can be then mainstreamed in with other children. M Mr. Reynolds, I'm so, sorry, we're going oh, to have to end there, but quickly in the next 20 seconds, how many signatures do you need and by when? And, and we, what are the We need 433,000 valid signatures statewide by early November, and I think we definitely will be able to get on the ballot, and I think it hopefully will win overwhelmingly, not only among Anglos, but among all the other communities in California. Quickly, who finance this uh, initiative? Well, I put in a good deal of my own money. Other people put in money as well. It's a popular initiative. It doesn't take a lot of money to our, get on the Unfortunately, ballot. we have to end there. We will follow the money trail later, but I want to thank our guest, Ron Unz, who's a proponent behind the Unz Initiative. I also want to thank our members of our new California Media Network, Gregory Rodriguez, Henry Liam, Kevin Weston, and Milang Eze of uh, Channel 26. And uh, thank you very much. I'm Emil Guillermo. Join us again next time for more information and insight on the new California from the writers and editors who cover it, the new California media.